Good evening. I'm Alabaster Katz, and it's time for another tale to tell in the dark. Welcome to the show. Tonight is a good night for screaming names into the dark, and although a name can seem unimportant, we shouldn't forget that they all carry meaning, even though it may not be the one we wanted. And that brings us to tonight's story, the idea that a name can be both a blessing and a curse, and that even a monster is not immune to its power. So join me as we slip into the sad and the strange and learn about a monster who fell in love with a boy and of the name she was given. Once again, it's time to grab a drink, dim the lights, and hold hands with the presence next to you. The show's about to begin. I once met a boy who wasn't afraid of monsters. I was young then, less than a century old, but forever trapped in the appearance of a nineteen-year-old girl. I crept into his room through the shadows on the wall and stood at his bedside to watch him sleep. It had been a year since I last tasted a human, and the time had come for me to feed once again. Unfortunately, a plague had dwindled the population of the nearby village, leaving only the young and healthy from which to feed. And in a town riddled by plague, the death of a healthy young man was cause for notice. Therefore, I found myself in the predicament of having to drink only what I needed and not my fill. The boy was about twenty, or perhaps a little more, had I been human, I would have thought him handsome, but such emotions were not privy to my kind. Still, I took the time to admire the youthful features of his face, that is, until he opened his eyes. Who are you? He asked with a start. I leaned closer, tempting him to look down the neckline of my emerald dress. A vision... Drawn to you by the music of your innermost desires, will you dance with me? He pushed himself away, more out of confusion than fear. Are you a vampire? It was a common misconception, one which had irritated me for almost a hundred years. Although it was true I drank blood, vampires were deceased humans infected with a contagion. I, however, was a fairy, thus magical in nature and able to control my thirst. I was also from Scotland, not Romania. I am not a vampire, I said, smiling. I am a Bavanshi. In your tongue, it means fairy woman. Why are you here? The boy pressed. I've come to dance with you. That is, unless you think me undesirable. Tugging at the thinness of my dress, I placed my knee on his bed, but he looked away disinterested. There's no need for deception. I'm not afraid of monsters, nor am I afraid of death. If I am to die, then I ask that you allow me a moment to see the stars. Dropping the charade, I looked at the boy with growing interest. Why are you not afraid of death? The plague has taken everyone I hold dear. I have nothing left but emptiness. Then why the stars? The boy looked at the sky through his bedroom window. Because their beauty can never be touched by the ugliness of the world. And it brings me comfort to think that perhaps when I die, I will join them. 
I had never heard a human speak of the stars in such a way. To them, the night was something to be feared. Yet here was a human who saw beauty in the darkness. I am moved by your words, boy. My kind believes that the night and all who live beneath her are beautiful. Perhaps the ugliness you see is only in the light. Only in the light? He said with interest. Yes, to hear the calmness of a cricket's song, to smell the dampness of the clouds and feel the evening dew beneath your feet. These are things of the night. To see them, you must know the difference between being blind and being unable to see. The boy moved closer. Will you show me? Despite my pity for him, my hunger could no longer be ignored. No, the hour is late and I must feed. You have been kind to me, boy. Therefore, I will leave you unharmed and seek my meal elsewhere. Farewell. Then I turned to step into the shadows and he grabbed my hand. Wait, please stay. The warmth of his blood pulsed against my skin and I snarled. Do not mistake my mercy as everlasting. I am hungry, and the scent of your blood does little to improve my mood. Then perhaps we could come to an arrangement. Releasing my hand, he raised his arm and offered it to me. You may drink my blood here, in secret. In return, I only ask that you visit me each night so that we may talk. I gave the boy a dubious look. You would let me feed upon you willingly? Yes. Why? Because I wish to know the difference between being blind and being unable to see. I sniffed the air to check for the scent of betrayal, but found none. Content with his offer, I agreed. Then drink, he said. And when you return tomorrow eve, we shall speak more about the night. Nodding. I took his arm and placed a finger above it. You're an odd one, boy, but you are also interesting. I look forward to seeing you again. Alistair, he replied. My name is Alistair. Very well, Alistair. I shall visit you again tomorrow eve. Then with a prick of my talon, I brought his arm to my mouth and drank. Time passes slowly for my kind. What is days to humans only feels like minutes to me. However, after tasting Alistair's blood, I felt a hunger that left me counting the hours before dusk. When night finally arrived, I stepped through the shadows and into his room, only to find him already awake. Hello, fairy woman. I was unsure if you were going to come. Why shouldn't I? We have an accord, do we not? Yes, of course. I'm sorry, I, I should not have doubted you. Unaccustomed to human sincerity, my lips curled to a smile. So, what shall we talk about? I asked. How about we begin with your name? I do not have a name. My kind has no use for them. A name is much more important than just being useful, he retorted. And for what purpose does a name have other than to identify oneself? It allows others the opportunity to remember you. I grinned and let my dress slide off my shoulder. Am I so quickly forgotten? No quicker than the seasons change, he said, blushing. But it would be nice to call you by a name, even if only in my thoughts. Would you allow me to give you one? I paused to consider his request. An interesting offer, Alistair. Very well, you may give me a name, and I, in turn, will respond to it. Alistair furrowed his brow with feigned concentration. How about... Berta? He grinned. Absolutely not. I will not be named after the croak of a frog. <laughs> I thought names didn't matter to your kind. They do not. But if I'm going to be addressed... It's not going to be to the sound of a toad. 
Very well. I will consider something more suitable for a fairy. Yes, please. Alistair's gaze drifted up to the stars, and he fell quiet. Then he looked at me and smiled. There is a name that I like. I always thought it rather enchanting, but never knew anyone to have had it. Why, Alistair, I said teasingly, do you find me enchanting? I would be a fool not to. I smiled. So out with it then. What name will you give me? Elizabeth, he said. The name sounded of fireflies buzzing over a meadow. I could smell the wildflowers that had closed their petals under the moonlight and feel the evening breeze rustling through the grass. I was surprised that humans could create a word that captured such beauty, let alone something a fairy could feel. It's beautiful, I said. Befitting a fairy, he added. For the rest of the night, we talked. Alistair asked many questions about my kind. Where do we live? What do we all look like? How much blood can I drink? He didn't shy away from the more gruesome aspects of my nature, which was something I appreciated. I also asked questions about him, and was surprised to find that he spoke of things that other humans ignored. He explained how he enjoyed watching the rain trickle down his window, and how he listened for the silence between each breath of the wind. These were things my kind understood. They were important things. Things to spend a lifetime pondering, but for humans, they were nothing more than a moment to go unnoticed. He also told me about his childhood, and how he was ridiculed for wanting to know how to talk to spiders. At this, I felt twigs snapping and rocks cracking as I made a mental note to pay his tormentors a visit. The more he spoke, the more I wanted to listen. It was only when he saw me look to the horizon that he stopped. Do you fear the sunlight? He asked. No, we simply vanish in the sunlight. I am more concerned with what the sunlight brings. Alistair nodded, understanding. People, he said. Yes, despite humans being my prey, they are also my predators. Most aren't like you, Alistair. They don't understand that my need for blood is no different than the wolf and the rabbit or the owl and the mouse. I feed to live, not because I enjoy the act of it. But you're a magical being. What could you possibly have to fear from humans? Iron, I answered. My magic is useless against it, and my flesh sears at its very touch. Alistair frowned as he looked at the sky. Then make haste, he said, extending his arm. Raising a finger, I punctured his skin and began to drink. I'm sorry, he added. I didn't mean to place you in danger. The fault is mine, Alistair. I would have left sooner had your stories been less enchanting. Why, Elizabeth, he said, smiling. Do you find me enchanting? I smiled back. I'd be a fool not to. Alistair blushed. Tomorrow Eve, then? Tomorrow Eve. Then I stepped into the shadows and vanished into the night. Nights became weeks as Alistair and I continued to meet. We had grown fond of each other's company and gradually spoke of deeper things. I spoke to him about what it was like to feel the night and the thrill of running naked beneath the stars. His blood had also grown sweeter with each taste. I didn't know which human emotion caused it, but unlike the bitterness of fear, this had an intoxicating effect, leaving me eager to taste him again and anxious when I couldn't. So what happened next? asked Alistair. I asked if he knew how to make a troll stew. And did he? In a way. So how did you escape? I asked him to wait while I fetched the ingredients. And he just sat there? For three days. Trolls aren't very bright. I wish I could have seen that, said Alistair. Catching my breath, 
I smiled as an idea crept into my thoughts. Come with me, I said. I'd like to show you something. Where are we going? I took his hand. Into the night, then whisked him out of the window. We soared into the air, a pair of ravens darting through clouds and gliding over fields. I could feel his heart racing as the wind passed through his wings. We pitched and rolled through cliffs and trees until the fires at the village became dying specks of light in the darkness. Then we came upon a great forest where we dove to the earth and landed on bare feet. Alistair gasped, his face pale but alive. That was wonderful. I pressed a finger to his lips to keep him quiet. Look, over there. I pointed to an oak tree where a fox was curled in its trunk. Then slowly, several pairs of tiny wings fluttered into existence as pixies and fireflies began to illuminate the burrow with a gentle glow. The fox began to chitter and snarl as it struggled with an unknown pain. Then suddenly, the sound of tiny cries echoed in the forest as the mother fox gathered her newborn kits to feed them. I looked to Alistair and saw his face wet with tears. I didn't know there was such beauty hidden in the dark, he whispered. Now you know the difference between being blind and being unable to see. We stood in silence for a moment longer before I was forced to interrupt. We must head back. It'll be daylight soon. Then, with a rush of wind, I whisked him back into the air, where the core of two ravens faded in the distance. When we returned to Alistair's room, my hand lingered on his for a moment too long. A strange rush of warmth flooded my cheeks, and I looked away. Dawn approaches. I must leave, Alistair. But you haven't fed. You needn't worry. I will feed tomorrow eve. And before Alistair could say more, I stepped into the shadows and disappeared. The next night, I didn't want to visit Alistair. During our time together, he had grown steadily weaker from my feedings. I had considered leaving him to find another meal, but my desire to see him outweighed my hunger. When I appeared in his room, he looked at me and smiled. Here, he said, offering his arm. We can talk afterwards. I know you're hungry. I looked at the many scars on his skin, and a dull ache tightened around my chest. Turning away, I shook my head. Alistair, how much longer are we going to do this? He paused. Until you've had your fill, I suppose. No, I said, snapping. I will find my meal elsewhere. There are too few left in the village, Elizabeth. If you were to feed on them, you would be exposed. I could feel the warmth of a summer night wrap around me whenever he said my name. No, I... I cannot do this any longer. Alistair took my hands. I would gladly give you my last drop if it meant seeing you again. Clouds formed overhead as my tears began to fall. He drew me closer. Do you remember what I told you when we first met? I nodded. I said, if I am to die, then I ask that you allow me a moment to see the stars. He lifted my face and smiled. I no longer need the stars, Elizabeth. I have you. Crippled by the pain in my chest, my body shook with sobs. He pulled me into his arms and my skin smouldered at his touch. Then he drew my face close and I closed my eyes. I could feel the burning light of a comet streak across the sky and the wings of a thousand moths tickle my skin. My head went dizzy with his scent and my lips tingled from the heat of his breath. And as my talons extended from the excitement, a voice cried out from the window. She's here! She's here! The monster is here! A man in a red robe thrust his crucifix at me, and I felt a stabbing pain in my skull. Alistair raced to the window and drew the curtains. They found you! He panted. You must leave! 
Trampling footsteps echoed throughout the streets, and within moments we were surrounded by torches and an army of red men. They pounded at the door, rattling its wooden hinges. Open up! In the name of the church! Alistair braced a table against the door as I glanced around the room to search for another exit. Quickly, Elizabeth! Jump through the shadows! But the searing pain in my temples prevented me from using my magic. I can't, I groaned. They're crosses. They're made of iron. A bang shuddered the door as the red men began to break it down. Clutching my temples, I fell to the floor and Alistair cradled me in his arms. Leave me, Alistair. It's me they want. Tell them you were bewitched. He placed his hand on my cheek. No, if it is a monster they want, then a monster they shall have. Then, without warning, he yanked the blanket off his bed, wrapped it around his shoulders, and leapt out the window. I am the Barvanshee, he wailed in a high-pitched voice. I curse you humans, and all those blinded by the light. There she is, the red men cried. Get her! And within seconds, a mob of robes fluttered away from Alistair's house. When the burning in my head subsided, I used what little strength I had left to step into the shadows. The next evening, I crept into Alistair's room only to find that it was empty. Worried, I took to the sky as a raven in search of my mate. Before long, I picked up the scent of his blood and followed it to the village square. It was there that I found him, bound in stocks and shackled in irons. He had been beaten, whipped, and burned by the red mob. I perched on a rooftop nearby and whispered to him through the shadows. My dearest Alistair, what have they done to you? They beat me with sticks for giving them chase, and whipped me with leather for cursing the light. Then they purified my body with their ignorant flames, and left me here to atone for my sins. Tears fell from my raven eyes. I cannot reach you, Alistair. You are bound in iron and I am unable to come any closer. Alistair smiled through bloodied lips. Then why can I still feel you in my arms? Desperate, I swooped towards him and crashed to the ground, screaming in pain. Alistair cringed at my anguished cries. Elizabeth, stop. I cannot bear to see you in pain. And what of your pain? I cried. Am I to bear yours in silence? The scent of his blood was beginning to fade along with his beating heart. Alistair, please, tell me what I can do. Tell me how to save you. Raising his head, Alistair gazed at me and smiled. I'm not afraid of monsters, nor am I afraid of death. If I am to die, I only ask that you allow me a moment to see the stars. Then he closed his eyes and fell silent. Historians will tell you that in 1666, a great fire ravaged London and burned down the surrounding villages. This, however, is not entirely true. To this day, just outside the city lies a patch of unmarked land occupied only by ravens. It was here that a plague-ridden village once stood. A village where a fairy fell in love with a boy, and a boy was killed by monsters. So, in my rage, I raised the city and buried it in the ashes of red-robed men. On that day, the harbingers of iron and hate gave me a new name. A name they carved in stone and scratched on paper. A name they whispered to children only in the light of day. In the old days, I was called a Bavanshi, a fairy woman in a green dress. But these days, I'm called something else. It's a name that inspires dread and draws upon the image of a woman in white, cursed with such terrible grief that her wails portend the death of a loved one. I once met a boy who wasn't afraid of monsters. He called me Elizabeth. 
But you know me as Banshee. That concludes our show for the evening. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed my presence in the room. Next time, we return to the creepy and the quaint as a boy tries to help a little girl who warns him about a patient witch. If you liked what you heard tonight, consider subscribing to the Alabaster Cats podcast for some more borrowed time. There's always room for another body to fill the shadows. Once again, thank you for joining us. I'm Alabaster Cats, and remember, the best stories are the ones we tell in the dark. Special thanks to tonight's voice talent, Nora, for her role as Elizabeth, and Tyvier in Sussex for his role as Alistair and the Red Men. <laughs>